we go any farther, they say, then I feel like we need to pray. We need to touch heaven's throne this evening. We've got some teaching that needs to be brought out, and we want to make sure that there's no power of hell that's going to be able to stop and bring any kind of confusion in whatsoever that would hinder the word of God from being heard. We're living in the last days, and people need to know what's taking place. All of you that look, if you have an urgent request, would you hold up your hands, please? God sees every need in the house, and, and tonight, as and we pray, we're also going to pray for the offering, the tithes, and, and you can just get up and just take them to the back basket back there. We're going to start back our old ways on Sunday of uh, receiving the offering, but uh, we're going to go to God in prayer. you got a prayer request. I do. Amen. Yes. Remember those that have lost loved ones. We was at a wake this evening, and uh, the funeral will be tomorrow. There's others that have passed away, and God knows who they are. And there's families that's hurting. There's steady families. There's people <laughs> really that they've lost their loved ones, and they don't know which way to turn. And we've got a God that's able to comfort our hearts and to help us this evening. So if you would stand, if you're able, if not, you can remain seated in the house of God. Brother Richard, take us to the Lord and others join in. Almighty God, Lord. Father, this evening, we just glorify your name. God, we honor you. We magnify the holy one of the God, there are needs in the house tonight. There are needs tonight, God, that only you can do. I pray for the love of Jesus.
What you can do is go to our home church page, Elgin Congregational Holiness Church, Elgin, South Carolina. Subscribe to it. That way you'll be able to get right to it. And on that page, you will find our Facebook page. You will find our YouTube page. And you can find all of these teachings and so on on that page. And you can go back and get the first two parts of this teaching. The first one I titled the third great exodus. We learned a lot about Israel in that. And the fact that the fig tree. That it's the season of the fig tree. And we don't know the day nor the hour he's coming back. But we can know the season. We titled the second one, The Hand of God on the Land of Israel. We saw a lot of the miracles that took place, how that God helped Israel as a nation to get back in the valley of dry bones and so on and so forth. But the root, let me say that the book of Revelation can be understood. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 pronounces a special blessing on those who read, who hear, and keep the words of this prophecy, it said, for the time is at hand. Amen. Now let me say, I do doubt that any one individual has a total knowledge of the book of Revelation, but God would not put something in his word and not give us understanding of it. It just takes study. It takes much study. You've got to go into the Old Testament to Daniel and Ezekiel and these different prophets and you have to line them up in order to get the understanding. Yes. Now the word revelation itself in the Greek is apocalyptus. And, and I can't speak Greek. So uh, you know I probably don't pronounce it right. But I know what it means. It means to reveal or to unveil. And if you read Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. It actually gives us the way to divide up the book. In order to give you an understanding. Chapter 1 verse 19. He said write these things which thou hast seen. The things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Well the things which thou hast seen. It goes from chapter 1 verse 12 through verse 20. And what that was was the things that John upon the Isle of Patmos had seen of Jesus when Jesus was on this earth. He had seen him, Brother Gibson, as a faithful witness. He had seen him as the first begotten of the dead. He had seen him in a vision on the Isle of Patmos. So that was the things that thou hast seen. And then he told John, he said, write the things which are. And that meant the things which were going on at that moment when John was alive concerning the seven churches. Brother Richard, you've been teaching on some of that. And it takes us Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 and actually down through the ages even into the day is the church age. As a matter of fact, we are living in the Laodicean church age, the age of lukewarmness. And then the third division that God gives to John he said, the things, write the things which shall be hereafter. After what? After the rapture of the church. After the church age. And it actually starts in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. The rapture takes place somewhere between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Because at the end of chapter 3, you see the church on earth. But the beginning of chapter 4, the saints of God are seen in heaven. So from chapter 4 on, basically everything is futuristic. Takes place after the rapture. What are we waiting on right now? The rapture of the church that could happen at any moment it could take place. Praise God. Now, this is the book of prophecy, but let me say to you that are listening that we need to take it as literal as we possibly can. It is full of symbolism, but when something is symbolic, you will know that that's a symbol of something. It'll be quite obvious. 
But if you study and compare other places in the Word of God, you can figure out. Remember I said last week or the week before, we do not interpret Scripture, but we compare one Scripture with another. When you interpret, everybody has an interpretation. But when you compare one Scripture with another, then it will lead you to the truth of the Word of God. Okay? But if he said, I saw an angel fly through the heavens, then he saw an angel fly through the heavens. He didn't see an airplane. Okay? And, and he, God knows all the languages on the earth. He created them all. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. So we take it as literally as we possibly can and we would know whenever it is symbolic and then we find out what the symbolism is. Y'all with me so far? Yep, amen. Now, what I want to do tonight is start out in this teaching by giving us the order of events that are to take place on planet Earth. You would be surprised how many people out there do not really know what it is that is to take place and when it's going to take place. But we're going to look at the order of events or the timeline that planet Earth is looking for and the next and the first thing that we're going to look at that needs to take place and we as the church are waiting on and praise God I, I, can't, I can't wait to get there is the rapture of the church. Yeah. Now, the word rapture itself is not in the Bible, but it's, it's the coming, the parousia. I know I didn't pronounce that one right. But it means the snatching away. Yes. We call it the rapture. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't believe in the rapture, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. You just sit right there when it takes place. <laughs> uh, I do believe in it, and I believe it's going to happen. Praise yes, God. As a matter of fact, there are many patterns in the Word of God talking about the rapture that shows us. And I can go into a lot of them, but one of them that a lot of people mix or miss is the feasts and the festivals of Israel. They have the rapture right there in them. God gave them to Israel in the book of Leviticus chapter 23 and, and in other places. And there's seven feasts and festivals and Jesus is fulfilling every single one of them. Yes, Four yes. of them have already been fulfilled yes. by him. Let me just give them to you quickly. I mean, we can make this a two-part message. One of the first feasts that he gave was Passover. We know that was when the lamb was slain. At the very moment that the lamb was being slain in Jerusalem, who was being slain on the cross? The lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself. The very next feast started that evening. That started their next day. But, but it was actually evening time for us. And it was the feast of unleavened bread. It began at sundown. And at that particular feast, I'll just briefly throw something in here. They would take in the children, they would bury a piece of bread, the Jewish nation would. And they would make it a game of the children finding it in order to resurrect it. But that evening they would bury that bread somewhere. They would reach into the center of that loaf of bread. Hallelujah God. Who was being buried in a tomb at that exact time they were doing that? Jesus was placed in the tomb on the time of unleavened bread. You look at the next feast that he told Israel to participate in was called First Fruits. And it happened, we call it Easter. And what happened on Easter was the Jewish people would send their children out to try to search for that piece of bread and they would find that piece of bread that had been buried and they would resurrect that piece of bread. It takes place on the third day. It was unleavened bread and it took place at the exact time that Jesus was resurrected from the tomb. You understand? And then at the same time, what did he do? It was called first fruits because they were bringing in the first fruits of the harvest. What did Jesus do when he come out of the tomb? He went into the bowels of the earth. I'm having to talk fast to get all this out. He went into the bowels of the earth 
And what did he do? He brought all of those out of there who were dead, who were looking to the cross, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and them. And he took and presented them before the Father at the first fruits of the harvest. Yeah. And then the fourth uh, uh, festival was the Feast of Pentecost, which happened 50 days later. And it marked the second harvest where more was gathered in than it was in the first harvest. But it marked the Holy Spirit coming to this earth to indwell mankind. And on that day, 3,000 souls were saved and the harvest was gathered in. And he's still gathering in the harvest even in the day we're living in. And that was called Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came to this earth. The next feast that the Jews are now looking for spiritually, what we are looking for, is called the Feast of Trumpets. Did y'all hear me? Trumpets, it represents the rapture of the church when Jesus Christ is going to come back and we're going to meet him in the air and a great trumpet is going to sound. And when that trumpet sounded through that feast and that festival, what happened was the workers working in the field gathering the harvest, even if the harvest was not in, when they heard that trumpet, and they, they did not know exactly when it would blow, but when they heard the harvest, then they dropped everything they were doing. They would go to the temple and they would worship God. Amen. Amen. Y'all see the symbolism of the feast and festival? There's two more of them. There's atonement and tabernacle, but if I don't go on, I'll never get through this tonight. So I'm going to leave those two out for explanation. But the point of it is, there are types and shadows throughout the Word of God that shows that there is a rapture. And then right after the rapture is coming the seven-year tribulation period. It is called Daniel's 70th week when a peace agreement is going to be signed but it's going to be broken in the middle of it and the Antichrist is going to rule and the mark of the beast comes into play and then we're going to see the seals and the opening of the bowls of wrath and, and the uh, trumpet judgments and we're going to talk about all that probably next week. But that's when a, a false prophet shows up on the scene and, and the unholy trinity uh, of, of Satan and, and the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they all come into play, and we're going to talk about that when we look at the opening of all those judgments, so on and so forth. But it's Daniel's 70th week. Daniel predicted it, or God prophesied it through him. What do you mean, Sister Luke, by Daniel's 70th week? Let me just give you a brief explanation because I can't say a whole lot about it. But there was a prophecy given, and it was from the rebuilding of Jerusalem that the Babylonians had, uh, had destroyed in the days of Nehemiah. Actually, the prophecy was given to exactly how many years and how, many, how much time that this earth had left. Now, he said that there would be 70 weeks. Now, remember one day is as a year, a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. When he said 70 weeks, what he was saying is there's going to be 70 years of seven years. One year is seven years. So 70 times 7 was 490 years. And he said the 69th week has already ended. He said there's going to be 70 weeks left on these weeks of 7 years. He said 69 of them has already taken place. When did it end, Sister Luke? It ended when Jesus come down off the Mount of Olives when he went to the cross to die and he was resurrected and he, yeah, 40 days he was seen upon this earth and he ascended back to the Father, Daniel's 60th night, 69th week ended. The time block stopped. There's one more week to go, one more seven year period. And it stopped and God turned to the Gentiles for what we call the church age and it's been going on for 2,000 years. He has been trying to bring, we are Gentiles.
Gentiles. He's been working with the church age of the Gentiles. But at any moment when the rapture takes place, the time clock for the last seven years will start again. And it's called Daniel's 70th week. So there's 69 weeks. The clock stopped. The church age come in for the Gentiles. It's been going on for 2,000 years. When the rapture comes, the final 70th week will take place. And that's when he turns back to the Jewish nation in order to try to get them to see that he was their Messiah. Y'all okay with that? I, did I confuse you enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's honest. <laughs> but anyway, in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, which is a tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to break his agreement with the Jewish nation. Okay? That's when... He's going to commit what is called the abomination of desolation. And probably he's going to cause an image or a statue to be built. And, and he's going to desecrate the temple that he allows the Jewish nation to build when they make that seven-year peace agreement. And by the way, my understanding is they've got everything ready to build that temple. They can build it in less than six months. And we know that that temple is standing by the middle of Daniel's 70th week. In three and a half, after three and a half years, he goes in and desecrates that temple. At that time, the Jewish nation up to that point had thought, this is our Messiah. They thought he was the Messiah. But then when he desecrates that temple, he realized, they realized, wait a minute, if he was our Messiah, our Messiah would never have desecrated his own temple. And they realized what happened. He turns on them. He goes after them to destroy Israel. And Israel begins to flee out of Jerusalem. And when he, they start to flee, he goes after them like a flood. And, and Jesus, or God himself, sends tidings, it's called, from, was it north and west, northeast, or somewhere. But what that means is God causes other armies to raise up against the Antichrist. So the Antichrist has to stop going after Israel, turns around and goes to fight these armies, which gives Israel time to go on and flee, and they hide in what we think is Petra. Okay? So... But what happens is, and, and remember right now, I'm just trying to give a timeline. I'm not doing a good job, am I? <laughs> but anyway, there's a seven-year tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation period, then there is the final battle of Armageddon. And when I end up this teaching, my last teaching, I will be talking about and teaching on the Battle of Armageddon. That will be the final one in a couple of weeks. But anyway, it's the Battle of Armageddon. After the Battle of Armageddon, at that time, the false prophet and the Antichrist, who are mere men, empowered by Satan, are cast into the pit, the lake of fire, okay? They're, they're in hell. Satan is bound for a thousand years. That is the thousand year millennial reign. Okay, y'all with me? Now, after the thousand year millennial reign, the Bible said, Revelation 26 through 10, Satan is let loose again, believe it or not, because he's only been bound. And he's let loose for a little Season to try one more time to destroy Israel and take over the kingdom that Jesus has set up. And he goes out, the Bible said, to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth. And would you believe after Jesus set up that kingdom and everything is peace, that there's actually people on the earth who will join the Antichrist and Satan, or Satan rather, and one more time they will go to destroy the kingdom again? How in the world can you be that stupid? Yeah, that's right. 
But in that final battle, after that thousand years, the Bible said fire comes down from heaven out of God and it devours all of those who follow Satan and who do this. And then they are then cast into the, into the pits of hell and they never ever are led out again to deceive the nations again. That's then when the great white throne judgment takes place where the evil dead are called up from wherever they buried at, wherever they're at. A lot of them are out of hell because hell opens their gates and lets them out and they are judged and then they are cast into the eternal lake of fire. Then this earth is re renovated, redone. We have a new heaven and a new earth, and it goes back to the Garden of Eden. And finally, the city of New Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And you will have it said, no need of the sun or the moon, for God and the Lamb shall be the light of that city. And God shall be with his people. Amen. Give him my hand clap. Praise the Lord. Now that is the order of events that we're looking for on planet Earth. And I don't want to be no farther than the rapture. Amen. Now I come back and ride that white horse with him at the Battle of Armageddon. Man. I don't even like horses. You got to teach me, like Richard said, to ride them. <laughs> but I come back at Armageddon, hallelujah. But I won't have to be in none of this other mess. Praise God. Man. All right, I need to go on, don't I? Oh, glory to God. I can always preach up here. Oh, glory to God. You want to go on a first trip? You want to go on a first trip? Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, praise God. Let me see where I want to start at. All right, I'm going to start looking briefly at the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials or bowls of wrath. I will see how far I'm going to get, and at the rate I'm going, I can almost tell you I might get through the first seal. <laughs> That's okay. Look at the rest of it next time, okay? But as a little girl, I always thought when I heard that the first three and a half years of that peace agreement, that everything's going to be joyous and happy and peaceful, and there'll be no problem. But I found out, studying the Word of God, that that's not so. That's right. It's peace for Israel for the first three and a half years. But from the moment that the Antichrist comes on that white horse, that false Messiah, he begins to go out and conquer other nations, okay? It will, it will progress in chaos until by the middle of the tribulation period, as I said, he'll turn on the Jewish nation. And actually when the seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpet is blown, it is only the middle of the tribulation period. These judgments do not stop and end, or start and stop and end. One of them starts, it keeps going, just like the famines do and the wars do. The next one comes, it just joins in with that one that took place. The next one, it just joins all the rest of it. It gets worse and worse and worse, adding trouble upon trouble. And the, uh, the open of these seven sealed judgments, the first four are called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The horses are not literal horses. They are symbolic. Their colors symbolize what they represent, what they're doing. The riders are symbolic. The first one that comes along, this rider is symbolic on a white horse of the Antichrist. When the first seal opens, chapter 6, verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. You see from the very first, first moment, he begins to conquer other nations. The rise of the false Messiah. Remember, there's going to be a seven-year non-aggressive pact made. 
but he, he, uh, he breaks that in the middle of it. He's going to allow Israel, I'm repeating some, it's to rebuild her temple. Revelations 13 and 7 says that he is going to make war on the saints of God and overcome them. And he's going to have power over every kindred, nation, and tongue. You see, not everybody's going in the rapture. You've got to be rapture ready. He's coming for those that are looking for his appearing. When the rapture takes place, it probably going to be more churches uh, full then than they ever was. Amen. Because there's a lot of people who knew about it, who heard about it, a lot of backsliders and so on, who will not go in the rapture, and they're going to be left behind, and they're going to be the ones who say, well, I'll not serve the Antichrist and so on. I, I'm going to turn to Jesus. And But they don't know what they're in for. They should have served him before the rapture. Amen. You know, I've heard them say, well, I won't take that, Mark. No, sir. I'll let him kill me. Honey, if you won't live for him now, you won't die for him then. That's right. You understand? Amen. He's going to come out of the territory of the old Roman Empire that will be revised. To be more exact, I personally believe he will come from the area of Syria. Ancient Syria covered territories of present-day Lebanon and Iran and Iraq and Syria and what other place. So he can come from any of those because the Bible calls him, one name for him is the Assyrian. So I personally believe he comes out of that territory, the Roman, old Roman Empire. Revelation 13 says he is a beast that rises up out of the sea. When I went to, to the Greek concordance, and I went to every single one of these words in, in Revelation 13. And that word beast literally means he will be ferocious, savage, and brutal. That's, that's his personality. He comes out of the sea. It can pertain to the area around the Mediterranean Sea or the Red Sea. But, but also, it also represents a, a figure of evil a frightening place, an untamed place that resists us God. Mm. So he can come out of that area where we know they all resist God. Yep. 13 and 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. When you get to reading behind this, now there is another place that talks about a wound in his head, but in this chapter, one of his heads. That is one of the nations is what it's talking about. And when you get to reading this, it said that it, it had the symbol of a leopard. You go back and you get into uh, Daniel's prophecies and back in uh, when Alexander the Great destroyed, went after Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem at that time, his emblem was a leopard. And when you get to the root of this, what it's talking about is there will be ancient spirits. Those who, I'm talking about demonic spirits, who instigated and operated against Israel in the past are going to rise up again in the end times. The same one that helped Alexander the Great, the leopard, helped him to destroy it. Jerusalem back in the old days is going to show up again in the end time and going to help the, the beast out of the sea to try to destroy Israel again. Mm -hmm. So ancient demon spirits are involved in the book of Revelation. Okay? Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense so far? Yeah. I hope so. There's a lot to bring out. Now listen, I feel like he will be probably a Syrian Jew because Israel is not going to accept and think somebody is the Messiah that is not connected to the Jewish nation. 
They're not going to accept somebody that is a Muslim. You understand? So I personally feel that, and I do not believe that he will not, according to the word of God, come into prominence until the tribulation period. But I do believe the Antichrist is alive and well on planet Earth today. Yeah. He is waiting to be revealed. Okay? Now, what happens is he is not Satan. The Antichrist is a mere man empowered by Satan. Mm -hmm. But he will be a dynamic political ruler. He will headquarter the first three and a half years in the rebuilt city of Babylon. Israel, as I said, will believe that he is their Messiah. He will break that peace agreement in there. Some of you may not know that, but Saddam Hussein, and I hope I said his name right, practically rebuilt the city of Babylon when he was alive. The ancient, in ancient times, it was a beautiful city. It was built years, hundreds of years ago by Nimrod. He had a queen by the name of Semiramis. And this city is being rebuilt today. As I said, Saddam Hussein almost practically built that thing already. And the Antichrist will use Babylon for the first three and a half years where he headquarters there. The middle of it, he will turn on Israel. That's when he commits the abomination of desolation, desecrates the temple, Israel floods the peak or flees the peak drop. He is called the beast. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the man of sin, the little horn, the evil shepherd, the Syrian. All of those are the names of the Antichrist. He's going to be, as I said, a great political leader. Bible says a lot about him. You could go to the book of Daniel, chapter 28 especially. It says he will have a fierce countenance. He will have understanding of dark sentences. In other words, he will have the answers to hard questions. His power shall be mighty, it says, but not of his power. In other words, he gets his power from Satan. It says he will magnify himself and he will destroy many with peace. Says he will cause craft, that word craft means deceit, to prosper. Says he will speak great swelling words against God, and he will have no regard for women. You can take that two ways. First of all, in the Middle East, they don't care for women anyway. They treat them like animals. Also, I personally believe you can agree or disagree, he'll be a homosexual. Leviticus 18 and 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. But he has no regard for women, okay? He will come from the Federated States of Europe, that revived Roman Empire. Now, I want to get into some things. I've only got about 20 minutes here and let me just get in, try tonight to give you what his plan is. Because we're seeing some of this instigated today. He's going to have a three-point plan when he comes into being. First of all, a one-world currency. Yeah. It's going into that now. We are in a cashless society. He's going to make it that any financial transaction has got to be electronically monitored. Okay? You will not be able to buy or sell or do anything unless you take the mark. People say, I won't take that mark. Well, let me read you Revelation 13 and 16. He will force all. What does the word A-L-L -L mean? All. all. Everyone. To receive a mark in the right hand and, or forehead. Without it, you cannot legally buy or sell, hold a job, own a car, get a driver's license, get a birth certificate. You will not be able to do anything. Listen, cash money will be of no value. So all of you that's got your money hid away somewhere in your safe and under your mattress, you might as well pull it out and spend it or give it to the church, hallelujah to God, because through the tribulation period, it's not going to be worth a hoot. Yeah. You're paying attention right now, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are. I'm going to talk about that. But anyway, at that time, Brother Richard, when all the wars start, there'll be no McDonald's. They'll all be blown away. The electricity, you'll have no SSI. You'll have no government help. You'll have nothing. Do you know today that one area of China, a whole city has no cash whatsoever? They use face recognition and you swipe a card and it comes out of your account, just like we do a debit card, so on and so forth. There are places in Europe today that are cashless. The world is being programmed to have to do this. We have seen a pre-program of it through the COVID-19 just a little bit right here in America. Okay? Do you know that technology has made it possible to monitor every person on earth electronically? Small computer chips painlessly installed, virtually invisible to the naked eye, allows every move you make to be monitored. It's being tracked by GPS, the global positioning system. Do you know that if you visit the country of China today, the moment you get off of that plane, they got a camera on you, you are followed. Every move you make while you are there, every person in China is followed every day. They follow them to see what they are doing. He's going to instigate a one world religion. He's going to end up, he's going to want the entire world to worship him. He's going to end up abolishing all other religions. Uh, listen, it goes back to Ishmael and Isaac. It goes back to flesh against spirit, bond against free, Islam against Christianity is what it's going to end up. He's going to change times and laws, it says, and will mobilize nations to fight an Armageddon. He's going to instigate a new world order. Globalism is called. He's going to set up a one world government. There will be no national borders in the world. The nations will be ruled by international law imposed on them by international leaders. That's what he's going to set up. The new world order is a term to describe the uniting of the world's superpowers to secure and maintain global peace, safety, and security. They'll communicate through the wide, world wide web. Peacekeeping forces will be instigated by, by what's called a world court. There'll be no one you're going to be able to hide. That's going on today. You just don't realize it. Do you know that they're tracking our every move? Do you know that every single email you send is copied and they keep a record of it? Every purchase you make, every bank tra transaction online, every buying that you do, face recognition cameras are everywhere. They're in the streets and the stores and businesses. Phones and cars have got installed with Tracking devices, Google keeps track of us. Those little cards we scan at a grocery store when we go in to buy groceries, they do that to keep up with what you buy, what kind of groceries you buy. There's nowhere to hide and it's going to get worse and the elements are already in place and the world looks only for a leader to step up and use it. He's going to work with a religious leader and I've got to hurry on this one called the false prophet. Chapter 13, verse 11, Revelation. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. They're going to work hand in hand. As a matter of fact, it is this false prophet who causes the statue to be built that is set up in the temple and causes people to fall down and worship the Antichrist. He causes this statue somewhere or other, whatever their trickery is, to act like and look like it comes alive. He's going to have the ability to do false miracles. He's going to call down fire from heaven. It's the religious, the false prophet, go back and read it, that does all of this. He's 
He's the one who's going to demand that the Antichrist be worshipped and it's the false prophet who literally instigates the fact that they're going to have to take the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. I don't have time to go into all of it. Read it for yourself. Okay? But it said all the inhabitants of the earth will be forced, everyone great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in his right hand or his forehead, and no one's going to be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark. It's Revelation 13, 16 through 17. And biblically speaking, the false prophet is going to be the enforcer of the Antichrist global worship movement. Now with me so far, and let me give you what I can of some stuff that, I, that I've been researching. We know his number is going to be 666. I'm not going into some of this because I don't have time to get into all of it. But the world is being set up for that chip yes. to be implanted. We re it really is. Now listen, it was supposed to be in full force by 2017. But when Hillary Clinton, who was to carry this agenda, failed to get elected and Trump was put in there, and I'm not politicalizing, I'm just telling you the facts, it delayed things, but they're starting up again. I was reading behind Perry Stone, and I wrote down some things, word for word what he said. He told about the first when he first heard about this chip was in 1996, 14 years ago. He said a scientist who was working on a micro welding for a Russian satellite, and he was in contact with the men who happened to be on that satellite up in the space. And he set up a meeting, this scientist set up a meeting between Perry Stone and some of them, and I'm having to leave some of this out. But he told him, he said, do you know what the men on that satellite are testing? Perry Stone said, no. He said, they're testing the chip. This was in 1996. That's supposed to be implanted in the right hand or the forehand. And he said, they're doing experiments on it. He said, it has a lithium battery. They probably uh, even made it better than all this by now. He said, one day you won't. Now, this was a scientist telling this. One day you will not need money credit cards, social security cards, banking, or medical information. Nothing. You'll just scan your hand, run the scanner over your forehead, and it'll come to you. It'll all be on that chip. Years later, Perry Stone said he began to hear some things again. In 2009, a preacher friend of his was on an airplane. He sat next to a medical doctor who was going to a city where 3,000 doctors were going to meet together to talk about the new health care chip and how that was going to operate in the new health code. And the doctor said, we've had it for quite a while, we've tested it on people, but some blood types have rejected it. And the government has had us working on it to make it work for all blood types. Yep. And the doctor on that airplane said, you can go to a hospital, they put it in your hand or just below your hairline, on your forehead, they can do it in eight seconds. He said, I think we got it just about perfected. And you can have it inserted at the local hospital. And this was a man's exact quote on May of 2009. Said, President Obama is demanding we have it done by the end of the year. Perry Stone said, I want to make a statement. He said, I can back it up. I have proof of this. The reason President Obama pushed health care through absolutely demanded it had to go through was actually not just about caring for the people who needed help. It was about the health care chip. It is a tracking device. They make it in Georgia. At that time, it was $10 a month times 12 months, which is $120 a year times over 3 million people or Americans who would have had it inserted at that time had they got elected. He said they're going to make a lot of money off of this chip, $36 billion a year. Ain't that something? Three, there are three senators, one from a southern state, one from Pennsylvania, one from Virginia, who have made statements to the Washington Post 
saying they're going to do their best to block a mandatory chip implant in their state. Couple more, and I'm finished. Alisa, H-A-I-R-O-N, Haran from News Network, did a report on the RFID chip, and she asked the question, is this progress being made on the chip today? They said yes. A report on September the 14th, 2017, from INFOWARS InfoWars, it was titled, Implanted Microchip to Replace Credit Cards and Car Keys. Sweet is already using biometric chip instead of train tickets. It goes on to say 3,000 people in Sweden have already been implanted with this chip. In order to access cer certain areas of the building where they work, they had to have the chip. The train system, it said Europe is microchipping. America is implanting chips. Prisoners have to get them in the federal prison. prison. What Wisconsin workers were embedded with chips in a certain plant they worked in. India says that they began in 2012 to make an entire population to receive a number, and by 2017, it was supposed to be completed in India, the chip. NBC's Tom Costello reported that some, something within this new chip sends signals to the brain, once it's inserted, that affects the brain to where you will not want to pull the chip out. He said, this is Tom Costello's news report. He said, this technology is patented and he showed the patent and the title of it was System for Producing Artificial Telepathy and the patent number was W02005055579. A1. Terry looked that up and sent it to me. The patent is there. Let me give you what it says on the patent. If I can find it. It's called an artificial telepathy patent. It is a proposed device to be implanted in your body to give you a form of artificial telepathy. It will use transponders to network wirelessly to other transponders. In other words, Richard, you can have a transponder in you and Brother Gibson can have one in him, okay? You will be able to talk and speak to others through nerve connections inside the body. Same as thinking. A further enhancement of this system. This is on the patent. You can look it up for yourself. It's a, yeah. Think about it. We talk across the telephone, but you're talking inside the head. A further enhancement of this system will be capable of image transfer through a device connected to the eyes, and a small camera records what the eyes see. This device will emulate telepathy, and will give seemingly invisible voice and image communications with others connected with the network implant. Y'all hear me? Go look it up. One nice thing, and I'll close out. <coughs> This chip was supposed to be ready by 2017 in certain every one of us. Yep. But when Obama did not get elected, and Hillary didn't get elected, because her agenda was yep. to finish what? And I'm not politicizing. I'm just telling you, this was openly said. She said, I'm going to finish what Obama started. Yes. She would have finished that chip, okay? But I've got one last thing to say. We as children of God, we don't need to let nobody put a chip in us. Amen. Amen. Nobody. Amen. I'm thankful that we, our president got elected with the immense talent that he put aside for this. There was a I lot of things. God has used the man. God has used him. I will say that. 
Let me say this, and I will close. It's about three minutes to eight, and I try not to go past that. It might go two minutes past the night. Most of us live from payday to payday. If you're rich, I don't know it. I'm not. Okay? Most of us, the money runs out before the month does. There are others, not too many have been here, I wouldn't think, because they hoard up money. But very soon, your money is going to be useless. And the most valuable commodity you're going to need and you can have is food and water. Y'all can believe that or not. The true child of God will not go through the tribulation period. But you will go through some of the birth pains to get to the rapture. Look at what happened through the COVID. Did you go in the grocery store? How empty were the shelves? It started out of all things, no toilet paper. Y'all remember all that? Yeah. That's nothing to what's going to take place the closer we get there. Y'all might think I'm being crazy, but I'm going to say this, not out of fear, but out of wisdom. If you've got a place in your house that you could store up a little bit of canned food extra, some food and some water, you would be wise to do that. For the next plague of what is going to hit this world before the rapture takes place, it will probably be worse than what we've gone through. You need to do that. Amen. Find someone. You might say, well, what happens if the rapture takes place? Probably some of your relatives left behind will need it. Understand? They're going to need it. I'm through. You sure can't go in. People, we need to realize North Korea right now, they're sent out 